Many people have lost money trying to grow their wealth, but how do you know when an investment is too good to be true? Today's guest is Justin Donald. Justin is the host of the Lifestyle Investor podcast and the best-selling book, The Lifestyle Investor, The Ten Commandments of Cash Flow Investing for Passive Income and Financial Freedom. He consults and advises entrepreneurs, executives, and successful media personalities on lifestyle living. Justin has also appeared on nearly 100 podcasts, including Entrepreneurs on Fire, The Mike Dillard Show, Making Bank, The Accelerated Investor, and Unbecoming. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Justin, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey Podcast today. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to join you, Chris. This is going to be a a good time uh, together here. I'm sure it will. Can you give myself and the audience a little background about who you are, what you do, and why you got into it? Yeah. uh, My name is Justin Donald. Uh, I started a company and wrote a book called The Lifestyle Investor. And technically, I have a podcast by the same name as well. And really, it's uh, my way of kind of giving back and teaching others how to create a lifestyle that is exciting and compelling and purposeful or on purpose, uh, where instead of going through the motions, I feel like I've just met a lot of people over the years that they basically go through life on defaults and they respond to what's happening to them versus proactively planning a life by design that is incredible where they live their dreams and their goals and they uh, you know, have have true, you know, vibrancy. And, and so um, the whole purpose of my brand, the lifestyle investor is to teach people they can have a killer life today. And they can buy assets that produce income that covers their cost of living. So they don't have to work for money, they can work because they want to, they can spend their time on the projects that make the most sense for them. But the goal is to really help people buy their time back and not be a slave to money, not be a slave to the income they make, the lifestyle that they have, to the security or safety of a certain role, a certain job, a certain industry, and really break free of those chains to pursue a life that is really uh, exciting and uh, full of zest and, and joy. That sounds like I, I love your mission. Um, it's exciting for me is a number of years ago, my websites have done well enough that I've been able to uh, transition out of full time work and just do the stuff that I like to do. And uh, the podcast that you're listening to now is one of those things that uh, uh, my way of kind of giving back and sharing what I've learned and uh, getting up on a soapbox once in a while and uh, <laughs> trying to help people not to fall for those sort of scams. Well, it's cool, Chris, because if you hadn't created the space to be able to do to like carve out the time to just say, hey, what do I want my life to look like? What are what are the projects that really light me up that I would do even if I made no money doing them? You may not be having this podcast right now. We may not be having this conversation, yep. but you you put yourself in a place to have the time to do things like this that inspire you, that bring you energy. And that's really my mission is to help people buy their time back so they can figure out what it is they really want to do and who the people are they really want to spend time with. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I mean, I, I think our values are totally aligned in, in that aspect. And I, I'm super happy about that. And one of the things that you talked about is kind of people being kind of living their life, life reactionary. Um, and I kind of see that sometimes when it comes to investing in financial matters that people are just kind of very like, oh, I, I didn't plan on anything happening or, oh, my, my friend told me about this this great deal. Let me jump on it with not understanding what it is. Yeah. The thing that I hear all the time, you know, in, in what I do, Chris, is, I mean, I, I hear it's like nails on a chalkboard. Some of the decisions people make, why they make them, uh, how little research and time and energy goes into it. In some cases, people just throw their money away. Chris, I have people that are part of my group um, and people that I've interviewed for, you know, my mastermind or, or different, you know, coaching projects that, most people would consider them having enough money to live the the rest of their life. But in many instances, they have lost millions to hundreds of millions of dollars. 
um, you know, in, in one case, um, I mean, we've got someone in our ecosystem that, that did lose over nine figures oh. of income and, uh, or net worth rather. And it's just so important that you're surrounding yourself with people that are experts in the thing that you want to be the thing at. If you want to get into shape, spend time with a fitness coach that looks the way you want to look, not someone that can, you know, says, Hey, I'm a fitness coach. And they don't look that way because yeah. everyone today is a life coach. So you got to be careful that you're not taking advice from someone that hasn't done the thing that they need, you know, that, that you want to do. But if you want to build wealth and, and I say this, not just from a financial standpoint, a financial is a component of it, but mm -hmm. if you want to build true wealth, then it's buying your time back. It's being physically and mentally, spiritually, intellectually healthy. Um, then you surround yourself with people that are doing that, that you are inspired by the life that they, that they live, that they lead. And that's who you want in your ecosystem. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So what? where are people going wrong in terms of what are the mistakes they are making, kind of red flags that they're making in these decisions in, in choosing the people in their ecosystem? Well, a lot of people don't run decisions that they make by other people that have more expertise in that space. You know, so that, that's one easy thing that I see happening. Another thing is that a lot of people in financial services do not have... What, what's what's the most polite way I can say this? They there uh, is not in alignment. Um, they're not in alignment with their clients. So in other words, a lot of people in financial services and the way that the whole system is right now, it, it, it's a broken system. It's manipulative. And Wall Street kind of controls the narrative. And so Wall Street makes money whether you do or not. And then people on Wall Street get compensated regardless if you do or not. So there's misalignment. People make money when you don't. And that is a dangerous place to be because anytime someone can be a money raiser um, and get compensated on those dollars, they they probably don't have your best interest in mind. Or maybe I should say there's a chance. Mm -hmm a good chance that they don't have your best interest at in mind. And by the way, I've got a lot of friends in financial services. I've got a lot of friends that are wonderful in the space. So not everyone is is like this, but the stats are the stats. And, you know, over the last 15 years, only 5% of all money managers outperformed just a simple index, a S&P 500 index. So most people pay more for a worse result. I, I guess one of the one of the things that I think of is, People in the financial, maybe this is a different explanation. If people in the financial services industry uh, get commission, uh, and they may get more commission by directing you toward a product or a service that actually isn't in your best interest and isn't the, the best financial thing for you, and, and that's going to be the challenge. The pressure on them is to do what's in their best financial interest versus you doing what's in your best financial interest. Well, on top of that. My experience has been most of the things that people in in you know financial services wanted me to get into, they didn't even have their own money in it. So that to me is like the the bigger issue is like you won't put your own money in it, but you want me to do it. But you don't know that if you don't ask. And I, yeah. I mean that's something at the beginning that I didn't ask, and now I always ask it. Yeah, there was uh, my wife and I. We we know our our financial advisor that we work with. We know the lifestyle she lives. We know her values. She talks about where she does her what she invests in. It's like okay, I know who you are and why you're making the recommendations you're making. You understand my tolerance for risk, or my probably more likely my lack of tolerance for risk. And, yeah, and your yeah. help. We're, we're collaboratively able to come up with what's what's a good direction for us to go in our finances. Yeah. And you want to trust someone. And again, there are great people in the space, but there are more people that are not going to get you the result you desire than people who are. And keep in mind, in the last 10 years, it's kind of hard for, I mean, the, the stock market's been on a boom. So if you're not making money in the last 10 years, that's a big red flag. I mean, almost everyone's making money in the last 10 years. So, but, you know, this is something to track and make sure that 
expectation meets reality. And then there's this manipulation of the numbers that they share and, and kind of skew them to make them look like they're performing better than they really are. So you kind of have to do your own work and do your own math uh, to make sure that it's, you know, it's on the up and up. Yeah. Are there particular, uh, as we're not necessarily providing financial advice to people, are there particular kind of products and services that, you know, kind of buyer be wary? Like I think of, let's say a good one is like, Right now, crypto is everything. Oh, throw your money in crypto and it's going to double or triple in the next three weeks. And it definitely won't. But, you know, that's what you hear people saying left and right. Um, and there's definitely significant risks with that. Are there certain kind of platforms and products and things where, you, while they may be legitimate investments, people should be wary of? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, there are two mindsets to go into, you know, let, let's talk about cryptocurrency or NFTs. These are the two things that are really booming right now. Uh, and, and you know, even your 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 uh, play to earn gaming, you know, we can group into this as well. And so there's incredible opportunity to, to make money, uh, but there's also incredible opportunity to lose money. And not all projects are the same. And mm -hmm. so one, you know, one group of people go in as like gamblers. Well, let me, I'm going to gamble. And, and by the way, sometimes that works out. And unfortunately, sometimes that conditions a bad behavior, bad habit, bad expectations of how good someone is at something. And later they lose because of just, you know, not really recognizing what happened the first time around. You've got other people that go in and they do the research and they say, hey, I actually buy into this strategy or into this utility in this particular cryptocurrency or in this token or in this blockchain. And so in that instance, I think that it can make sense. So at the end of the day, um, I think there are going to be a lot of crypto projects that fail, that just don't make it just the same way that most businesses don't make it. Yeah. I think the majority of cryptocurrencies won't make it. But I think the ones that do make it are going to do extraordinarily, extraordinarily well. And if you get in early and still right now, this is early, you know, you can have an incredible return. Yeah. And it's also one of those things is it can go to zero. <laughs> it can. It can. So can stocks. So, you know, part of the reason people say invest in, you know, mutual funds. And, and by the way, I don't I don't really care for mutual funds as much these days, but at least an index is that you're getting a grouping, a collection. And so, yeah, I mean, there's always the risk that uh, things will go to zero, whether it's mutual, well, mutual funds, you got to get a bigger problem if a mutual fund goes to zero. Uh, like what, what should people be watching out for in terms of like kind of get rich quick schemes and how to identify them and kind of know w what is a, le a potential legitimate, maybe high risk investment versus, oh, this is, this is just a ploy to separate you from your money. Yeah. So there are a few things, you know, if we're talking in the world of cryptocurrencies, uh, ICOs, initial coin offerings, I mean, those I think are going to be super high risk. Really look out for those. A lot of these do well only for a period of time, the whole concept of pump and dump. Um, but, you know, the same thing is true in, you know, a company that goes public. Let's talk about like a SPAC, for example, you know, you you go public and you start at ten dollars. It, it could go up. It could go down. So I mean, you, you may experience some similar things there. Um, same thing on a new company that that you know just gets listed and, and has an IPO. Um, th there's, I would say, any time that you have a guaranteed return, you should probably dig in uh, because guaranteed returns are hard to come by. I mean, how guaranteed is guaranteed? I mean, if everything goes wrong how are you protected? Like yeah. you, you can't just have a contract that says, oh, it's guaranteed. Okay. Well, how is it guaranteed? What's it guaranteed by? Is there collateral backing it that if this dies, I get the, I get the asset that is, is collateralized in which case I make my money back. So, um, and anytime something sounds too good to be true, Nine out of 10 times, it's too good to be true. So, so let, let's define in your mind, too good to be true. What kind of like, what kind of rate of return kind of starts to get you to question an opportunity? Well, anything above the norm and anything where people basically say there's no risk or that, you know, there's virtually no risk. There's probably some element of risk. Now, there are things you can do to de-risk a deal, 
but inherent in virtually all deals, there's some form of risk. Um, so anytime I see something that is being projected above the the standard or the norm in that industry, you know, my antennas go up. And by the way, you know, I just want to be open, you know, with you and your audience. Part of the reason I know what to look for is because I've lost money. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have made poor choices. I have trusted the wrong jockey. I've had people lie to me. You know, in my book, The Lifestyle Investor, one of the first things I do is I outline where I invested in a Ponzi scheme. And, you know, the... I didn't see the signs then. And in some cases, they totally lied. So maybe you couldn't have seen them. But today I see some things I would have done differently, some due diligence items I would have done differently. And that was a too good to be true situation. It was a guaranteed return situation. There were just some things. There was a contract that um, it was too, it, it was obviously not created by an attorney or a very good attorney. Um, so there are just some signs that, uh, unfortunately, I got lured in and I started cashing paychecks that hadn't happened, mm. right? So I, I looked at the return as a done deal versus making sure I was mitigating on a worst case scenario, Right. When you say you were cashing paychecks, you know, that you hadn't gotten yet, were you talking about like, I see my account, my account balance at the advisor, at the institution, at the entity is going up, but I actually haven't drawn any of it out. Is that what you're yeah, referring well, to? Well, and in this case, in this case, the company was good until it wasn't good, okay. right? So it actually didn't start as a Ponzi scheme. It was 27 years of like a legitimate company and then it became a Ponzi scheme. And oh. so- to a certain degree, it makes it hard. Like, how do you really know? But there, there, there are, are signs, there are cues, there are tells that you'll learn to pick up on. But in this instance, sometimes it's like, oh, you're giving me a 22% return guaranteed. So in my mind, it's like, okay, I'm cashing this 22%, right? And I see a lot of people fall prey to this type of thing where they um, romanticize the amazing return but keep in mind the return isn't like real it's like a it's a number they put there and it's not a done deal until you get all your money back until yeah. the investment goes full circle and so anything can go wrong at any point in time so would one of the, so would a warning sign be something and i know there's asset classes where you can't touch your original investment and you can't get your money back out for a certain period of time is that something that in and of itself is a red flag or is that just kind of a kind of a small depending on what it is it's a red flag well it could be a red flag i mean it depends on the type of investment in real estate generally you're not going to get your money back quickly but i mean like one of my 10 commandments in my book which is like my 10 criteria for how i invest um is i do look for my principal to come back quickly mm -hmm. um that to me is safer because it de-risks the deal. Maybe I don't make the return on those dollars for as long, but if I get it out, then I've de-risked the deal and I've got some upside uh, on house money. So I look for that. There are other deals, like there are ways to invest right now. I mean, here, I'll just give you one perfect example that I see a lot of people doing. Uh, angel investing. Mm -hmm. They find a startup and they're like, oh, this is great. I believe in this or I believe in the team. And they invest in this company. But the reality is we don't know if that company is going to make it. There's, I mean, there's a 96% chance that that company is not going to make it, actually. Uh, and at that stage in the business, um, pre-revenue, it's even, you know, it's probably 97 or 98% likely it's not going to make it. But you don't know that and you won't know that necessarily for maybe even 10, 15, 20 years. So in essence, what you've done is you've given your money to a high risk investment. It's like the equivalent of like a 0% interest loan for an undetermined period of time <laughs> that just doesn't end up working out. It's just, yeah. it's a, it's a poor investment unless a, you know what you're doing. B, you've got some insider baseball. C, you, um, at scale have enough of these companies that you only need one to hit and you're and you have enough of them. Generally, 50 is the magic number in, in angel investing. If you have uh, 50 different angel investments, probably one's going to hit. That's going to cover all the losses. Um, but most people don't have it at scale. So most people, they invest in this idea that's pre-revenue. It's, pre, you know, in some cases, it's like 
you know, pre-product. <laughs> and it's, it's and, on a napkin at this point. Right. And so that is so high risk investing. But most people look at that as like one of the only ways to invest. To me, like that's the, like the, the last place that I invest. I mean, I get all my others. I get my cash flow first. So that way, you know, I'm comfortable. I can live my lifestyle. And then I invest in other like asset classes that I know are going to appreciate uh, and have a good return. I want to invest in healthcare and I want to invest in technology. I want to invest in affordable housing and agriculture and energy and, you know, all these different areas, um, you know, original content, music, royalties, um, cannabis, hemp, CBD, e-commerce. I mean, there's just so much that uh, you just know it's going to increase, improve like SaaS uh, platforms, like subscription platforms, mm -hmm. uh, you know, technology based. Uh, I mean, so to go in the direction of like a high risk angel investment that most people don't even see as being high risk or they don't understand that, uh, that to me is just crazy. I, that, that's like way after I get everything else done. Is it kind of like you operate with the mentality of, uh, can I afford to, if I lost my entire investment, am I okay with that? Is that kind of part of your thought process? Yeah, it needs to be. Can I, like, does this put me in financial peril that if I lost it, like my life would be massively impacted? That might be too much to invest then, right? Um, I do think that that's important. Or if you're going to invest in an amount where there could be some impact, I mean, maybe scale back, you know, the, the total dollar amount but maybe invest in something that's a lot safer, that is an asset that holds value that, you know, it's not going to go to zero. So in a worst case scenario, you're, you're still getting money back. I mean, most real estate, and especially if you buy cash flowing real estate, it's not going to go to zero. And then if the market tanks, but you have cash flow, then you're not worried about what the price is. You don't have to sell it. Yeah. So there's so many ways that you can invest in things where you're protected, where it's safe, where you're not going to lose the value of your money. But yeah, that's got to be in your mind. And, and in fact, one of my attorneys, uh, one of the greatest lessons I learned from him is look at every deal as if it's going to fall apart. And then from there, try and put, play the story of how it would actually work. Because you're going to make a whole lot of different decisions than if you think, hey, this is going to work. Let me pick it apart a little bit. Why don't you just say, hey, this isn't going to work. But if it did, here's why it would work or here's how it would work or here's what would need to happen in order for it to work. Yeah, that reminds me of a, of a friend who uh, was going into, a, going into a business and it went, it went south and extricating himself out of it was just this huge nightmare. And he came away basically saying that the lesson I learned was it's, it's really easy and sexy to get into business with somebody. But what no one ever talks about is – if this deal goes south, how do we both get out of it without hating each other? Like no one right yeah. no one spends time working on the exit clause. They 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 think about the profit sharing, how are we gonna you know, how are we gonna make millions together? But no one thinks about if this goes bad, how do we get ourselves out of this? Well, we could do a whole episode, Chris, <laughs> on just like business partnerships and yeah. how those go bad. Oh. I mean, the reality is, is almost every business partnership is going to end at some time, right? And 90 plus percent of them end poorly because the way that things start is not the way that they end. And money is a magnifier. Yep. Money magnifies who people really are. And so, you know, there's a certain amount of, you know, a facade that people can have, but the ultimate magnifier, you know, when money comes into play, is going to bring out people's true colors and and you're going to see. And unfortunately, in many cases, you're going to see something that you don't care for as much or that maybe you didn't even realize was there. So these are things I think they're important to unpack, you know, so like as you know, talking about pray or be weary, be weary of business partnerships. When they work, they can be great. But I would go into those knowing that at some point it's not going to work. Um, I mean, this is... Uh, Think about divorces, you know, I think we're somewhere at like a 50-50 oh. staying married and staying divorced. You know, on the business side of things, it's like 90-10. I mean, it's most business relationships end and they end poorly. So you want to think through that, make sure that you're in alignment right out of the gate. Make sure you discuss all the stuff on the front end. 
Yeah, and, and, and not that I want to go a whole a whole uh, total segue down businesses, but even like the the whole thought of like, well, if one of the business partners die, how is that handled? Like, no one thinks about that until someone's in the hospital and it's too late. Yeah, I agree. I mean, all these plans need to be thought through before documents are signed. And all this really should be addressed in the operating agreement. Yeah. But, you know, people getting into business uh, haven't always been in business before. And unfortunately, I think, you know, I've learned this and you've probably learned this as you, you learn a little bit through the school of hard knocks by doing something and it falls apart and it's really messy. You kind of go, oh, I don't want to do that again. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And you're going to learn great lessons one way or the other. Um, and I wouldn't, I would just pick your business partners wisely and have open, transparent communication about concerns, fears, uh, everything. And it's likely going to work out a lot better. I don't want to scare people out of doing, you know, going into business because, you know, of such a high breakup rate, because there's a lot you can learn in the process, even if you do end up breaking up. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've I there are some things that I've done that have gone horribly awry and been a total failure in, in the sense of the business aspect of it. But the lessons I learned, the processes that I learned way uh, were worth the were worth the financial cost of the experience. It's kind of like, uh, in, yes, kind of like learning and getting learning an MBA through, you know, you, you can either pay your school or you can you know pay it out in the business losses. That's right. That's right. <laughs> maybe maybe that's not a good comparison, but you could definitely when things go south, you could definitely learn a ton from it. You just have to learn the lessons because the money's gone, the time's gone. So if you don't learn the lessons, then that's the, you know, atrocity of it all. If you learn the lessons, then that's great. Then next time around you're better prepared and you'll likely, you know, serve your time and your finances better. So, so is there another lesson that you've learned from your personal experiences in investing and trying to, trying to enjoy your lifestyle where you realized after the fact, oh my gosh, that, that was a huge mess. I, I should have X, Y, or Z. Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I could give you a laundry list of stories. I mean, one of them is uh, buying a job, right? I mean, one way that a lot of people invest is they like to buy a business or they like to buy real estate, but that business or that real estate can end up owning them. I mm -hmm. see this happen all the time. Someone transitions from passive income, you know, from a corporate job uh, to passive income, and then they want more passive income and they keep adding passive income to the point that that becomes its own business that then runs them and they've lost the passive aspect of that income. It becomes active income and they're tied to it. So I think you got to be really careful that you're not buying a job. So from an investing standpoint, you know, if you're looking to transition from a corporate gig, maybe you're an employee, you want to become self-employed. Um, maybe yeah, I, I don't know what the situation is, but maybe you want to pivot and you're okay spending that time. I think that's great. And that's where I was, where I was willing to spend time, you know, in, in real estate rentals for me specifically is mobile home parks. Um, and so that trade off of time made sense today. I wouldn't do the same thing though. You know, today I value my time differently today. I'm not trying to replace income from, you know, another business to cover my expenses. That's done. So the difference today is I don't want to spend more time. I'd like to invest so that my capital alone works and my time is reserved for, you know, people that I love. Uh, but so often I see people buy businesses, start businesses, uh, invest in real estate where, you know, they own it, their, you know, the, their name's on the deed and it ends up owning them. Yeah, I mean, I would say the same thing with my business for many, many years. Like the amount of time that I would spend to it would just every year just got a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And it's like, okay, I'm I'm not doing this right. Yeah, I'm making more money, but I'm obviously not doing this right because the the job, like you said, the the job is running me, not me running it. And over the last couple of years, I've figured out how to learn how to delegate more stuff and. Uh, work smarter, not harder. And it's definitely freed up time for me to do things like the podcast. That's right. Yeah. And that's amazing when that happens, when you can find that space and you can truly buy your time back and you can focus on what it is that's going to bring you the most joy. That's an incredible place because 
you know, I, I saw something, I actually posted this on, on, uh, social media. Uh, you know, it's the, basically the difference between, um, rich people and wealthy people. And it was a picture of a gold watch, uh, where someone old uh, owns like a gold expensive thing. And then there's a picture of a watch that isn't gold. It's just, you know, clear, there's no color to it. Mm-hmm. But in that example, that person owns their time. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's, that's the difference. Yeah, I mean, who I, owns your time? <laughs> yeah, I definitely like to be in the position of owning my time and being the master of my time, and it, it's a huge. It, it is it is a very nice position to be in. And I'm very grateful for that. I, there's one other thing that I that I occasionally hear in investment commercials, and I figured I'd run it by you because maybe it is also a warning sign when companies talk about targeted returns. To me, it's like. Are you trying to pretend that you're guaranteeing it, but you just don't want to use the word guarantee and you're throwing a big number out in front of me? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, this is going to be par for the course. So people are going to say, hey, here is the return that we project or that we target. Keep in mind that that means nothing, <laughs> right? So you can't get your hopes to the fact that that's what you're going to earn. People sell you on their investment by having a higher targeted return. So the targeted return doesn't mean anything until it's full cycle and you see what the return is. The better question is, what was your targeted return on your last deal? Meaning what was your pro forma? What was, what was like everything went to, you know, plan and how far off from that were you? So that to me is the better question because a targeted return means nothing. Hey, you can gauge what you think it's going to be, but that means truly nothing. It may come, you know, above it, below it. I mean, there's no, there's nothing to say that that number is going to work out. It's just, in, in some cases, it could, they could have a plan of why it may work out, but in other cases, you're saying it could just be they just pulled the number out of the air and that's what they're hoping and praying for. Well, everyone has a plan, <laughs> and then what happens when things don't go to plan? Yeah, you know. I just, anytime I see a targeted number, most people get lost in this, you know, in the allure of a good return. I would rather say, okay, in a worst case scenario, what happens? Do I lose my money? Do I lose part of my money? Do I lose all my money? Do I lose none of my money? Oh, okay. So I, so this is safe. This is secure. It's collateralized. I can't lose any money. And my return, maybe it's not the sexiest return out there, but if I can't lose money and I can earn a decent return, great. That sounds awesome. Sign me up. Most people go for the great return, but there may be a lot of risk. There, It may not be uh, a situation where they're going to get all their money back if something goes wrong. Yep. And I, I suppose another trap that people get into is kind of thinking that uh, just because something had a good return at one point or just because it did well in the last 30 days that it's going to continue to do that for the next 10 years. Yeah. Well, keep in mind, everything's had a good return for the last 12 years. So, I mean, if you have invested in something in the last 12 years and it didn't work out, they must've been really bad because it is hard to lose money in this cycle. When you print this much money, when 40% of the dollars in circulation were created out of thin air within the last two years, all asset prices are going to increase at the same rate as monetary supply increases. And so, I mean, you really would have to work hard to lose money on an investment, right? Like even people that are unqualified that probably shouldn't have their own syndications (laughs) made money, okay? Uh, They have no track record, no experience, the only time they've ever done it and they posted a huge return. So I like to look at the track record much beyond that. I want to see someone that has, that's had a 20-year track record, a 30-year track record. I need to know they've at least gone through the, the 2008 financial crisis. I want to know what the results look like. I want to know what they learned. Did they lose money? Did they not lose money? Um, ideally, if they went through the, the dot-com yeah. uh, you know, bubble, like I, I just want them to have gone through rocky times and I want to know how they responded. I want to know how their business did. I want to know the pivots that they've made. But if someone's only been around for a decade, that doesn't mean anything to me. Everyone's made money in the last decade. Well, I, th- I think that goes back to what you were saying before. I want to know, I want to know what's going to happen when things don't go as expected. If it, if, yeah, because if, ultimately that's what's going to happen. Every deal will have things. No, no deal goes to plan. That's all I'll say. No deal (laughs) 
goes the way that it's supposed to go. Not even my uh, not even my money market account earning point one percent. You know, I mean, hey, if you've been in the stock market, it's been good to you. But if you were in the stock market at the time of COVID, where it dipped, oh. you know, thirty percent, and then you got back thirty percent, most people are like, oh yeah, it's a wash. I'm back to even. No, you're not. You lost thirty percent, and then you gained thirty percent, which means you're negative. Yeah. Right. So like. You know, if you had money in the financial markets uh, in 2008, 2007, 2000, you know, right in there, 2009, um, so much was lost then that it takes a long time to get that back. So truly look at how many dollars, you know, what was the total amount of money you put in? What is it? What is it worth today? And what was your real return? And it's and divide that by the number of years. It's it's going to be a different number than what they put on your statements to keep you giving them more money. Yeah, because they're it's, you know, always follow the money. <laughs> yeah. And let me just for simplicity's sake, you have one hundred thousand dollars. The market tanks, you lose, you know, you lose 50% of your, your money. I mean, think about financial crisis. This is not an un, you know, unreal situation. You lose half your money. Okay. So you go from a hundred thousand to 50,000. So you lost 50%. But what if you gain back 50%? Yeah. 75,000. Well, you're at 75,000, not a hundred thousand. So your average return is zero, a negative 50. And a plus 50. So your average rate of return is zero, but your actual return is negative 25%. That's rough. That is rough. Uh, so as we're, we're winding up here, uh, any parting advice and where can people find you online? Yeah. I mean, my parting advice is find a group of people that this is what they do. And they know investing, they have a track record, they do what it is that you ultimately want to do. The the five people you surround yourself with and spend the most time with are the people you're most likely going to become. Uh, we've heard this over and over, I, I believe originally from, from Jim Rohn, maybe someone even before Jim Rohn that you become, uh, that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, that's true get a mentor in some way, shape or form, get a, a coach that is doing the thing that you want in whatever area of life it is. If it's yeah. in finances, find someone that is living that life that, you know, wants to pour back in a way of coaching or mentoring. Um, so that would be my biggest advice. Um, there are a few ways that you can find me. Uh, if you want to read my book, it's called The Lifestyle Investor. And uh, for your audience, I'm going to give it for free. They just oh, have to awesome. pay shipping. So if you go to lifestyleinvestorbook.com, uh, that's where you can get that for free. You can, of course, get it on Amazon or wherever else. But all the proceeds of that book go to charity. All right. All of them go to a group called Love Justice International. They stop human trafficking in over 20 countries around the world. They're absolutely incredible. Um, so you can get that at lifestyleinvestorbook.com. And then if you want to learn about any of my other programs or or uh, groups, it, you know, you can check out my website, justindonald.com. Uh, and on there, you know, I've got a blog for, you know, obviously that's free. I've got uh, a podcast uh, as well. So a lot of free uh, info. And then I've got an online course, a masterclass. I'm rolling out a new mobile home park course um, that is an extension of the, the mastermind. Um, so we also have a mastermind, a, a group of, you know, just 100 amazing people. Uh, so those are the main programs and products that I have that, uh, you know, people can look into if they have interest. That's awesome. We'll make sure to uh, link to all of those in the show notes. Justin, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. Hey, thanks, Chris, for having me. It was really fun talking and, and you know, getting to know you and kind of learning uh, all the all the cool things that you're doing for your audience where you're looking out for them and trying to protect them from predators and whatever the industry they're in is. So kudos to you. Hats off to you. Thank you much. Enjoy your day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Prey Podcast. Notes to the transcript of this episode with Justin Donald can be found at easyprey.com slash 107.